Advent 1, Hope. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. We put our hope in the one to come, the promised one who comes from God to bring good news of salvation. We hope in the one who will lead us to walk in the light of the Lord. We hope he will not let us live in dark valleys, but on the high mountain of God. We light this candle in hope. Good morning. I have some announcements today, but first off, I'd really like to thank a group of people who got together yesterday and decorated our church and also wrapped many, many books for our mothers of preschoolers to uh, read to their children uh, a book every night before Christmas. And there was many, many books down there uh, in the the Adirondack room if you'd like to take a peek at them. Um, Thank you to Linda Flint, Cindy Van Allen, Andrea White, Betty Twardy, Beverly Simmons, Mary Chase, Janet Finley, Bob Baker and Art Shrum for putting up the tree for us again this year. Thank you very much, and I do hope you enjoy the minimal decorations that we have this year. Uh, Now, um, don't forget about our reverse Advent calendar. There's copies in the back. Um, If you are so inclined, we are collecting food for Christmas boxes and our very own food pantry. For more information, you can contact Cindy Van Allen or Andrea White. But it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a nice list back there, and every day you put something in the box. Now, uh, next Saturday is our Shepherd's Pie Dinner, and I do have tickets. So uh, it's going to be a a, a um, drive-through event here at the church, and uh, and, and people are asked to uh, circle around in the parking lot and come around to the front of the church and their order will be placed in their car. Uh, please wear masks in the car for us. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, and the menu includes a, a shepherd's pie made by June Wood from the Greystone Inn, and that's what she's very well known for, and a toss salad, a home-baked dinner roll, and dessert. And it's all for $10, and it proved to be a wonderful fundraiser for our church family and um, I do hope that you will support our effort. Thank you. There's a worship team meeting next week. Uh, it's uh, right after the 1030 service in Fellowship Hall. Please contact Vivian Cirillo if you have any questions and bring a mask. And I think that's all I have to say for announcements today. God bless you and have a wonderful week. And wear your mask. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to sing. Something is uh, annoying my throat this morning here in the church, so I'll try. <laughs> Desperation. 
This morning, we have uh, a few pre-concerns. First, Felice Decker is asking for prayers for her sister, Valerie, who is uh, now in St. Mary's Hospital in Amsterdam. Second, uh, Betty Twardy is asking for prayers uh, for her grandson, Jordan Twardy, who will be in great need of surgery on his anchor due to lightning strike on uh, last May. And also, Betty is asking for prayers for her brother-in-law, Jack Twardy. He is in the hospital with infection in the tube in stomach and running a fever. And Cookie Eaton, uh, who is in charge of uh, distributing foods for those in need through our uh, community pantry in our church, uh, she uh, asking for prayer for Donna Stifler uh, for kidney uh, infection. And as I announced, uh, a uh, couple of times uh, in the past two weeks, Bernie Landry has been moved from Albany Med to Sunnyview Rehab and is uh, in traction for fractures sustained in a fall. We pray for uh, a complete uh, recovery of uh, his uh, uh, upper part of spine cord. And we missed, I missed sharing uh, these prayer concerns last week. Uh, Dick and Dorothy Johnson are uh, asking for prayers for their cousin Susan Jones, who had her leg amputated and is now in Sunnyview Rehab. And uh, they also asking for prayers for Frank Malagasy. Uh, who is uh, one of uh, their uh, good neighbors, uh, early 50s, and his mother, Sally, both have serious medical issues. Each week, whenever you have a prayer concerns to share with our congregation in God's house, please do not hesitate to send uh, that prayer concern uh, to the hospital uh, through a phone call or email. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us a wonderful time despite this challenging circumstance caused by the, uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic this week. But as we usually do every year with our family gathering, not many families gather together this year because of the same reason, but you have led our hearts, you lift up our hearts and our spirits as we spend uh, with the thankful spirit, remembering how thankful it is for us to live in this bountiful uh, land, uh, America, every day in your constant care, provision, and protection, particularly of all our church people from such a deadly disease, uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic. We thank you again uh, from, our, from the bottom of our hearts for what you have done this past year with your mighty hands to protect all your children from accidents and deadly diseases and all other life-threatening circumstances. We love to gather together in your house to tell of your mighty acts. We commend your wonderful works to another generation we want to uh, meditate on your great works and wonderful acts of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. We want also the, uh, perform uh, the things you have uh, told us to do as your redeemed children. Every time we come to your house, uh, we love to joyfully sing of your righteousness and meditate on your uh, abundant goodness and sing of your righteousness. Uh, we ask your Lord to accept all our praising him, praising hearts and thankful spirits as we to continue uh, the act of our faith. 
We ask you, Lord, to be with every single person in charge of governing our country, our nation, America, particularly over the issue of presidential election. We ask you, Lord, to be with each one of them who is in charge of leading the future of our nation with your heavenly wisdom and righteous heart. We thank you, Father, for hearing of our prayer concerns, uh, who, which lifted up uh, the spirits of those who are being challenged physically and uh, spiritually. We ask you, Lord, to uh, also the uphold those who fall and listen to the cry of those who love you and who fear you. And you always watch over who love you and praise you from their hearts. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us, uh, uh, it's time for us to return our thanks through offerings. time to prepare ourselves, prepare the way, the way of the Lord, particularly in the first Sunday of Advent. Let us uh, uh, pray for the offerings we offered. We thank you, Father, for uh, enabling us to remember this time of the year as we prepare ourselves. The, Lord, the road uh, you are going to come into our lives 
as we think of the way you are dominating your spirit in the midst of our lives. We ask you to accept our thankful spirit first as we continue to keep praising you with our singing voice and thankful hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two scripture lessons today. The first reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. The branch from Jesse. A shoe will come up from the stem of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 25 through 38. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, <clears throat> who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was very old. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of the word. Thanks, thanks be to God. God.
A woman walked into her bathroom at home. As she did, she saw her husband weighing himself on the bathroom scales, sucking in his stomach. The woman thought herself, he thinks that he will weigh less by sucking in his stomach. So the wife rather sarcastically said to her husband, Honey, that's not going to work. That's not going to help. Her husband replied, Sure, it will. It is the only way I can see the numbers. I hope none of us had the same problem as this husband after particularly having a you know, big Thanksgiving dinner this past week and dressing meals with all the goodies to go with it. At the same time, we are given a health warning about overeating this time of the year. Particularly, Christmas is an excuse to get drunk have a party, spend money over it, and all kinds of other excesses. But let me remind you again, the kind of Christmas you and I need is a God kind of Christmas. You see, into this gloomy world filled with darkness, frustration, and brokenness, God sends his message Name, I got sent uh, a baby with his message. The baby's name is Jesus. And when God wanted to get his message through, especially a message that, you know, will penetrate the hopelessness and the gloom of humanity, he has wrapped it up in that baby. So I would like to call the baby Christmas hope. For in this baby, all God's promises came to pass. All prophecies fulfilled on Christmas. But this Christmas hope is different from the general meaning of the word hope. Of course, The sound of the word hope can lift our spirits when we are down. Hope gives us something to cling to when when we have lost our job, when we have lost our health or our beloved ones. And hope is a spark, spark that tells us someday everything will be better. Yet the problem is, this kind of hope is always based on uncertainty. We can hope all we like for something, and we can hope that someday those will come true. Let me uh, introduce to you one uh, uh, ancient story which I found in preparation of today's message the story about the flying horse, the flying horse of the king who sentenced one of his vassals to death. The man begged a reprieve, saying he would teach the king's horse to fly by the end of the year. Otherwise, this man would be put to death. Later, this man explained, well, within a year, the king may die, or I may die, or the horse may die. Furthermore, who knows, maybe the horse will learn to fly. In this story, we recognize how advantageous it is to earn time when in trouble. People expect that there will be a change during the period of time they earned. People tend to take time as much as they can and expect some good result to take place. It is not wrong to do that. But it is like, uh, you know, launching a tiny boat in the vast ocean of time, expecting to some, you know, the, some luck happen to that 
small boat, merely watching, merely waiting. We call it accidentalism. Accidentalism. However, we Christians do not live in that way. We don't cast our precious life upon the waves of time or stick it to the wheel of fate. Our God wants us to do and to be affirmative and positive in our hope. We cannot build success only with time and hope. The Bible teaches us to add one more important ingredient to these two, time and hope. That is faith. When hope is anchored deep into faith and time, faith will be working together to produce what we expect. For faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. If we do not use faith, our time and hope will be just the products of accidentalism or victims of fatalism. Even if a fortune was dumped on your life and my life by accident in our lottery game, our joy will not be lasting long. For it is not money or wealth themselves, but the fulfillment of our long-weighted hope that brings us real joy and happiness. And when our hope is accompanied with faith, our life is getting excited and dynamic. For we have the assurance of hope, which is anchored deep in the ground of faith. The faith you and I have in God's word of promise. Do we remember the second verse of standing on the promises? Standing on the promises that cannot fail Through the howling storms of doubt and fear of sail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Can you join me? Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail Though the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail. Because our hope is anchored deep into the ground of our faith in God's words of promise. In today's New Testament text, we do not meet only a senior man by the name of Simeon, but we meet a senior woman, Anna. Anna was 84 years old. She was living in hope. She was a senior adult in years and years. But she teaches us the secret of growing older without growing colder. She had learned to see light in the midst of darkness loneliness because of hope she got based on God's word of promise. Then what about you? Where is your hope? As for Anna, her hope is not found in a relationship with another human being. Anna had lived with her husband just seven years. And this woman was a widow of about 60 years. Yet she was still living in hope. 
and giving thanks to God for the hope she had. Her hope was to see God's uh, words of promise fulfilled. Her hope was not in her husband or another man. Her hope kept her primed to, you know, look beyond the circumstance of her life, no matter how lonely, no matter how difficult it was. Dear beloved, this morning we had the first Advent candle lit and named the candle of hope. When we were lighting the candle, what do we hope? to see happen in our lives. Here we can think of the second lesson. People can expect something great or small or something possible or impossible according to the scale of their thoughts and minds. However, we find something different in the triumphant stories of the people of faith in the Bible. We realize that they did not expect from God something possible, but something impossible. Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, and many other people of faith had shown us a common denominator in their walk of faith. They did not expect from God what man could accomplish, but what God alone can accomplish. Isn't that something? Having such a positive mind attitude toward God has made their lives great and monumental in history. When Abraham exercised his faith, he did not hope for something he or other friends or other you know, human beings could accomplish. Neither did his children and grandchildren, particularly his grand grandchild, young Joseph, began to expect something much, much greater than Abraham, his great-grandfather. Joseph expected to become a great ruler in his day by dreaming it from a mere farmer boy. For he had faith in God who was uh, mighty enough to transform his impossible dream, his impossible hope into reality. And God did exactly what Joseph hoped. Then what happened? 400 years later, when Moses was sent back to Egypt by God to deliver his people. It was absolutely an impossible task. Yet when Moses expected it with faith in God, God made it come true. Then how about his successor, Joshua? He did not expect something possible, but impossible. When they had to attack the city of Jericho, they expected God to destroy the enemy's strong, strong you know, fortress, yet not with their military weapons, but with God's covenant box, which they were carrying with them in faith. And God has made their expectation come true, no matter how impossible their situation was. It was not Moses. It was not Joshua, but God, who enabled everything impossible possible. Everything impossible to turn out possible in their lives. If we receive all their miraculous stories as a real fact through our faith, we will experience the same God working in our lives to make something impossible possible to the point of surprising us. That story must not be only Abraham's or Abraham's descendants, but ours and our children. We pass it on to our grandchildren as Abraham did. The problem in Christian life of this day is that people 
do not expect anything greater than what they think, what they calculate, and what they see now. Probably in our life of hope, many people underestimate God's infinite power, God's, uh, you know, in, what measurable, impossible power. We expect something small from God's mighty hand. But when doctors determine it is not possible to have my cancer cured by any human doctor, their hand, what happened? Shouldn't it be our hope right from that moment to begin to expect God doing something impossible for me? That is the living, working faith. Upon this living faith, Daniel expected God to rescue him and his friends from being burned to death, even inside the furnace. Of course, we have to do faithfully, faithfully, sincerely what we can do as human beings first and ask God to do for us what we really cannot handle ourselves anymore. Jesus did not ask for food or drink or clothes. Neither would he ask for car or furniture or house, even if Jesus lived today. For every man can get from their labor and efforts those stuff. Rather, Jesus asked God for something impossible none of human beings can do. It was to have all his believers living forever in glorious, delightful states, even after their physical termination. That is what Jesus expected to see happen, his new kingdom. Yes, expecting God to do something great, even impossible in our life, is the living faith. In Psalm chapter 8, 110, the mighty God broadens the care of our expectations, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. God said, open your mouth wide and I will feed it, unquote. Right. Doing what God said, by doing what God said, we can obtain all God wants to give us. And today is the first Sunday of Advent when we expect the Messiah, Jesus, to come into our personal life. Do not ever expect Jesus to do something small for us, like the Jews of 2,000 years ago. The big mistake that they made 2,000 years ago was the expectation of the Messiah to merely de deliver them from political oppression and restore their lost land to them. But Jesus did not come to this world to do the same thing as Moses did, or anything any genius man could do. The Messiah God sent to this world 2,000 years ago did what human beings could not do. Neither would they dare think doing. What was it? It was his birth in the least place of the world, as Prophet Micah you know, prophesied. It was his uh, crucifixion as described by Prophet Isaiah. And it was his resurrection as the prophecy of Ezekiel. All these marvelous things done by Jesus are not the products of accidentalism, but the complete fulfillment of God's words of promise. Yet not only 2,000 years ago, but at the very end of this world, the same Messiah Jesus will be doing another impossible thing 
to save all faithful believers in totally astonishing ways, far beyond human imagination. It was if we expect such an incredible experience to be fulfilled in our life by the same Jesus, expect him to do something marvelous. Our tomorrows will be bright and truly blessed. So, when, you know, uh, Jesus comes to visit our personal life in this time, in season of hope, and, you know, just to expect something marvelous, amazing for you and your family. And remember what the Almighty God taught. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. This word of God's promise, alone, alone, should be your hope and my hope and our expectation in this Advent season. And everyone can say, Amen. Amen.
O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits. By thy justice here, disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. O Lord, thank you for reminding us once again the true meaning of Advent as we prepare ourselves for the road, the way you want to visit into our lives. And now may the grace of the Father, our God, and such a love of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you now and forever. Amen.